Good morning. morning. And happy Thanksgiving. It is wonderful to gather together in the middle of this week to come and bring praise and thanksgiving to our God, to lift up our voices, our prayers, and our joys to Him. Welcome this morning, especially to those who are visiting. We're glad you're here. We pray that you'd be blessed in our time together. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 121 and Psalm 100. The psalmist writes, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. As we come before the Lord our God today, would you join me in prayer? O Lord, our gracious Father, we are glad, and as we come together this morning, Lord God, even on a day that is is foggy and and chilly and a little damp outside, Lord, you are still good. Even though we have come and, and we have aches and pains, we have struggles in our own lives, Lord, we still have so much to be thankful for. And Lord, that is because of who you are and because of your continued faithfulness and providence to us. And so, Lord God, as we take an hour or so this morning to to come before you, to be nurtured again in your word, but also, Lord God, to lift up our our praises and our thanks in in song and in prayer, Lord God, would you receive all the glory that you deserve, for Jesus' sake, amen. As we come into worship this morning, let's stand to sing, We Gather Together. And as we gather before his presence, we do so receiving his greeting. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's continue to lift up our prayers and thanks with we plow the fields and scatter.
You may be seated. As we come together today, much of our service is alternating between songs of praise and thanksgiving and then prayers of thanks and, and praise. Uh, and so at this time, I invite you to, I invite you to join me uh, with this responsive prayer and reading, uh, as you can see on the screen. Let's pray together. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our rock, our fortress, and our deliverer. Let, Let us, us remember, remember his, his mercy, mercy, for he, he is, is gracious and, and compassionate. compassionate. We thank you, Lord, for calling us to faith in Christ, for putting your spirit within us, for giving us the mind of Christ, for gathering us into your church. We thank you, Lord, for extending your grace to us, for beckoning us to a life of gratitude, for calling us to service in your kingdom. Thanks be to God. Let us give thanks to the Lord, for he satisfies the thirsty, he fills the hungry with good things, and he heals the afflicted. Let us celebrate God's abundant goodness. We thank you, gracious Father, that you provide for all our needs. We praise you, Lord, for all your gifts that go beyond our basic needs, for the things that make our work easier, for the conveniences of modern life, for the beauty and pleasure that you bring into our lives and your church. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now let's sing. Praise and thanksgiving. Before we go to God's word, would you join me in prayer? Oh Lord, our God, we give you thanks that you have brought us into this time, that you brought us into this place, that you are the God who rules over all things, that you are the one who has sent your son the word and who has continued to give us your word in scripture. Lord, we give you thanks that you have also given to all who believe your Holy Spirit. And we pray, O oh Lord, that he would open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to receive that which you have here for us today. Lord, that which is read and that which is preached. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, with that, I invite you to open your Bibles with me this morning to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel 7, verses 1 through 29. Uh, it, it does kind of... Well, obviously, for those of you who are here regularly, it's, it's fitting into a, a series that we're doing right now, looking at David as the chosen king, and that's going to lead us up into Advent and Christmas, uh, to Christmas Day with Jesus, the great king. Uh, but this morning uh, takes on a different tone. It's not the normal kind of narrative story that we've been getting used to in recent weeks, but, uh, but this brings us to uh, a, a, an oracle from God and then a prayer to God. And so to set this up, we left off on Sunday uh, with King David in chapters 2 and 5 uh, taking the throne, and we heard with the help of the king of Tyre uh, that he was able to have this palace built in Jerusalem. And so that's important detail number one as we come into our passage. The other important detail is what we find in chapter 6. 
that which we're skipping over to get to this point. In chapter 6, we read about how the Ark of the Covenant of, the, of God was brought up to Jerusalem, and David had a place set up. He had a tent set up that it was put into. Chapter 6 is also where you read about someone uh, being burned against with the anger of the Lord, one of the carriers of the ark. We also find in that chapter where David dances in an undignified way, much to his wife's displeasure. Uh, and so that's where that is in Scripture. Uh, but chapter 7 begins really with, with what I think all of us would say David has uh, pretty good priorities, right? He recognizes things are a bit askew. He is in this palace of cedar, right? This beautiful place, this beautiful building and home, and the object that signifies God's presence is in a tent. And he says, well, let's fix this. Wouldn't it be good? Wouldn't it be God-honoring if we would give him a building, give him a place that is really fit for the one true God? And what seems like a good idea to man, God says, not so fast. Doesn't actually say that, but that's my paraphrase. Uh, and we're going to read then what God did tell him, what God told the prophet Nathan to pass along to David. Uh, but then our message this morning is mainly going to focus on the second half. Verse 18 and following, the prayer that David offered to God. But let's hear the word of the Lord, Second Samuel 17. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a palace of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. David replied to, or Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it. The Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Whenever I have moved or wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture. And from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel, I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men of the earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning." And have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. Who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And so Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Then King David went in, and he sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, O sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. Is this your usual way of dealing with man, O sovereign Lord? What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O sovereign Lord, for the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. How great you are, O sovereign Lord. There's no one like you and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. And who's like your people Israel? The one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as a people for himself and to make a name for himself and to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations and their gods from before your people whom you redeemed from Egypt. You have established your people Israel as your very own forever, 
and you, O Lord, have become their God. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you have promised so that your name will be great forever. Then men will say, the Lord Almighty is God over Israel. And the house of your servant David will be established before you. O Lord Almighty God of Israel, you have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build a house for you. So your servant has found courage to offer you this prayer. O sovereign Lord, you are God. Your words are trustworthy, and you have promised these good things to your servant. Now be pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever in your sight. For you, O sovereign Lord, have spoken. And with your blessing, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you were raised in a Christian family, a Christian home, or, or you've been around Christians for long enough, uh, I'm guessing there are certain people in your life who you can say uh, they are prayers, and I'm putting that P-R-A-Y-E-R-S, prayers that you look up to. And so if you're in charge of praying for your family or get to pick who's doing that, if you get to, to choose who will pray at a certain function, at a certain occasion, they are the ones that you're first going to seek out because you admire how they pray. And so let's be clear, first of all, that prayer is, is not a contest, and God doesn't listen to certain prayers because they're better in our ears, because they sound so good. right? He doesn't listen to other prayers that, that aren't short-worded or aren't quick or aren't said with, with trembling and timid voices. No, some people simply have gifts in speaking, which comes out in their prayer. And yet for every believer, our prayers should be a reflection, a, a, a showing of our relationship with God. And so when I was growing up, I remember and I admired my grandpa DeGraff for his prayers. When we'd gather together at Thanksgiving time or at Christmas or at Easter, the whole extended family would sit around a, a long table just big enough for all of us, and, and grandpa or someone else would open the meal in prayer. And then we'd eat. And the kids would sit, and the kids would get antsy, and eventually the parents would decide, okay, we've talked long enough and made the kids wait long enough. Now we can have devotions. And so Grandpa usually would lead those devotions. He would close with prayer. And I can tell you, I don't remember. It's been a long time since I've been with my own extended family, but it's, it's not the exact wording that my Grandpa spoke. But in his prayers, I could hear his faith the way that he humbly came before God, the way that he gave thanks to him for so many blessings, the way that, that he approached God seeking favor for our entire family, whether you were there or not. My grandpa, still living, loves the Lord, and his prayers are a practice of that love. But I bring that up for you this Thanksgiving Day because the prayer that we find in 2 Samuel 7, I think at least, is an admirable prayer, said by an admirable prayer. David talking to the Lord, right? And you can hear it hopefully in the way that I presented that, that to me it's, it's a moving prayer, right? David has been awestruck by what has been revealed to him, that God has spoken to Nathan for a word for him and what he has planned not only for David but for his family. This is a prayer that, that's genuine, right? It's, it's prayed from true faith. It's a humble prayer. It's, it's a prayer that, that David over and over again says, I am your servant. Right? And that's a word that can often also mean slave. It's not an arrogant man's prayer. It's not someone saying, hey, hey, look, God, I, I kind of deserve this. I'm kind of a big deal in your kingdom. I've done great things. You deserve to bless me materially. No, David gives thanks and praise to God for who he is and for what he has done. And David sought his favor to continue his promises, that God would continue his promises, that he would come through, not because of what David did or what David accomplished, but because of who God is. And so we're going to get into to some of all those pieces this morning, but, but we begin here, that when you give thanks in prayer, express your love to and for God. When you give thanks in prayer, express your love to and for God. And the point here, if I was giving a, a children's message, I would simply say, remember who it is you are praying to. Right? Remember who you're speaking to. If you were listening, hopefully you heard it, but if you were reading along, you might have seen it 
some form of, of God's name or a title for God is repeated over and over and over again by David. And so every time we see the, the four capital letters, Lord, right, we're hearing the, the most proper and revered name of God, Yahweh. Right? And you can see if you count up all those times, it showed up 12 times from verse 18 to the end. Another word that comes up, another name, another title is the Hebrew word Adon, or, or you hear the word Adonai. And that showed up seven times, and often it gets put together with Lord, and so you have O Sovereign Lord in the NIV. Seven times we heard that word Elohim, and that's simply God. Right? God is referred to, that's who David is addressing. And you'll notice on the screen, there's one more Hebrew word up there. That's, that's the word Saba. It's the word that we get almighty from in the NIV or, or that the ESV and other translations put the Lord of hosts. Right? The Lord over all things. And so you read that and, and you hear this 26 times, if I've calculated right. We hear some explicitly name of God or title for God. And, and yet, who's praying here? This is David. Right? This is David, the king of Israel. He's just been told by Nathan at the request of God, hey, this guy is going to be one of the, he's going to have one of the greatest names. He's going to rank up there with the greatest men who have ever lived. The Lord is going to establish his throne, his kingdom, his house forever. And for many people in our world today that, that end up in power, that would be plenty enough for them to get a big head. Right? That would be plenty enough for their ego to blow up, for, for them to think, well, I, I'm deserving of this. We look at contemporary dictators, and, and some of them go by this title, supreme leader. Or you look at kings and queens and, and other leaders, and not to say that they can't be humble, but they have the words majesty and excellency and highness attached to their names. And there's at least one recent U.S. president, I'm sure only one, uh, if even him, who would consider themselves to have been the best, the greatest president who's ever lived, and I won't name any names. Uh, but even powerful and popular people, when they mention God or when they start to thank God, sometimes it comes off as fake. It seems to come off as just too much. Yeah, God is great, but look at this. I'm, I'm kind of right alongside of God. But in this prayer, it wasn't the case for David. Right? That's not what he does. He's humble, he's unpretentious, he doesn't claim to be owed anything. At least at this point in his reign, he still considered himself just like any other person, just like any normal Israelite. He's just a shepherd boy. And if that's how David acted, then who of us can think that we are or should be considered greater than he? And so that's the posture that we should take as we come before God in prayer on this Thanksgiving day and, and every day for that matter. That we are broken, we are weary, we are tired, we are stressed out, we are weak and limited sinners, not to mention most of us are just pretty normal people. And so we can try all day long to, to compare ourselves against others and say, God, you know what, I'm, I'm doing pretty well, I'm, I'm doing a lot better than this other person. But what gives us the right, who gives us the right to even come in prayer? It's not ourselves, it's not our standing. But humility is important in prayer. How can someone truly pray unless they've been humbled to the one who they are praying to? And yet again, the point that I'm trying to make here in this, in this first point today is not even that we are to be humbled, though that comes out of it, but, but we are to remember and our, express our love to the God that you and I are praying to. And so what does David say about God? Well, let's look at verse 18 briefly. Again, verse 18 in the NIV, David says, Who am I, O sovereign Lord? The English Standard Version, the ESV, goes a slightly different route, and it says, Who am I, O Lord God? And the word, as you see on the screen, that's not all capitals, is the Hebrew word Adon. The word that is all capitals is the word Yahweh. And, and I bring this out because the word Adon is not just a name, it's not just a title, but it means something. It really does mean sovereign. It really does mean Lord. And so you could say about those who are in charge of their households that they are the Adon of their households. They are the Lord of their house. And yet when it's used in Scripture in reference to God, He has a sovereignty, He has a lordship, He has a mastery over all things. 
over the whole world. He is the ultimate. You don't get any higher than him. And so when David uses this language, David is recognizing that, hey, I, I'm in charge of this nation. I'm in charge of, of God's people. I'm leading and shepherding them, but really, I'm number two. And that's not something that many kings want to take. That's not something that, that many who are in power are willing to say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not really the top spot. I'm, I'm over here. And yet that's what Israel's kings were to be. And so we're to understand and believe that God is sovereign still today. His sovereignty means his authority. His sovereignty means that he is active, that he is caring for what happens in creation still for you and I. Right? And so that means things like food. That means things like water. That means things like shelter. That means things like oxygen. Right? All of those things God is sovereign over. But he's also sovereign over your whole body and your soul. To love God and to express that love and acknowledgement for who he is and what he does should put us in awe of God. It's not a, a, a taking things for granted. To have a lifestyle where this is part of our prayers means that we stop thinking that we can manage life on our own, that we can succeed on our own, but that we depend on him. The good God who is and who knows all things from everlasting to everlasting, we love him, we need him. And we thank him. And so pray in such a manner that you don't forget who you're talking to and who you're depending on. But that brings us to our second point. Our second point of two uh, is a paraphrase of mine for Psalm 103, verses 2 and 5. Do not forget all God's benefits and the ways that he satisfies you with good things. Do not forget all God's benefits and that he satisfies you with good things. What was David thankful for in 2 Samuel 7? And, and someone's going to jump up and say, hold on, I didn't see the word thanks in there at all, and, and you're right, but, but I think it's implicit there. That David is thankful. Right? He's thankful, first of all, that the Lord had personally made him king. Right? That he has been assigned to this role, that, that, that he has been looked upon, and he's thankful that, that God is speaking to the future of his family on the throne. The second thing that he's thankful for, you see it up there in verses 23 through 24, is that God has chosen Israel. How do we know that? Well, we hear these words, your people Israel, the one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as a people for himself and to make a name for himself and to perform great and awesome wonders, clearing out all those who were before your people whom you have redeemed. You have established your people as your very own forever and you have become their God. A third thing that David was clearly thankful for is simply that God was God. That God, his words that are trustworthy and his promises are good. He's thankful for what God has done for him, what he's done for his people, and for who God is. In his prayer, David, though, wasn't only focused on the present time. And this is why I informed you a little bit about where this is coming from, what is is happening right now. Remember, all of this started with David saying, God, I really think I should build you a building, a great building. God says, no, not you, and not now. Right? We read elsewhere in Scripture, it's because of bloodshed, it's because God has Solomon. We hear that in this earlier part of the passage, that his son is going to build that. Right? And that's what happens. But also remember, God gave the instructions for how to build the tabernacle, right? This tent that, that Israel had traveled with throughout the 40 years in the wilderness, and God had filled it with his glory. God had told them what to do, right? And so the, the tent that God's holy place, his worshiping place had been in for most of time, it, it wasn't just a, a ragtag bunch of bed sheets that some kids put together for a fort. And, and yet a permanent and ornate structure is not everything. Right? It can represent something in worship. A permanent and ornate structure can be good, but a great building with no people and a lack of seeking God accomplishes nothing. It's not about the building. But again, David wasn't just thinking about the temple anymore. He wasn't just thinking, oh, great, I don't have to come up with plans. I don't have to figure out labor and materials. No, he's mindful of God's provision to Israel over centuries. Right? In this prayer, he's talking about how God took them out of Egypt. He's thinking about how God provided for them in the wilderness and sustained them as they finally settled into the promised land, right? The only reason they can even have kings is because they now have a home country. 
And now God was working with David. Now God was working with the future of his family and Israel together. And God promised that he had different plans for them than what had happened with Saul. David had witnessed that. And God says, not the same, David. Your family is eternal. Even though David hadn't lived through those times, even though he wasn't going to see his son on the throne, even though he wasn't going to see what happened into the future, he knew, he trusted that the Lord's promises were good and that the Lord was trustworthy. Right? In discipline and in grace and in prosperity, God would provide his people with what they needed. And so David was thankful. And so what about us? What are we thankful for? I'm guessing most of us are are thankful for the food that is already in the stove or or on the oven or I got those reversed. Hopefully your your food isn't on the oven. That probably isn't going to do much, but you're thankful for the food that is in the oven and on the stove or it will be soon. We're thankful for the vehicles that got us here this morning that run well, that get us where we need to go. We're thankful for homes and clothes that keep us warm, for beds that that allow us to have a, a comfortable sleep. We're thankful for family and friends and this church family to gather with and and to communicate with, even over long distances. We're thankful for electronics, technological, and medical advances. We're thankful for World Cup soccer and for the the Vikings at least having a good season. Uh, Most of those, not all of those, if you didn't realize, have bearing on this day. But uh, are you happy? I I gave your Vikings some credit. Yeah, all you Vikings fans, you're welcome. But God has satisfied us, and he has well beyond satisfied us with these things and so many more. And yet I'm still encouraging us to to do more, to think more broadly, to zoom out just like David did, to think outside of, of this day, even beyond your lifetime. What are you to be thankful for? Well, hopefully, above all things, you're thankful that Jesus came into this world. Right? That he died on the cross to save you from your sins. That, that he took upon himself the penalty that we deserve. He paid for it. And then he taught his disciples, and they taught their followers, and they taught others, and, and they took it out farther. And so eventually, down the line, it got to us, or it got to our ancestors. And they believed, and they shared it down their family line. We can be thankful that Thanksgiving Day isn't just a day when we're thankful to family, that we're thankful to friends, that we're thankful to a turkey, but we know who is the great giver of all these things. And it's the Lord God. But so too we can be thankful for the history of this church and the history of the congregations that have shaped you and I, wherever they may have been as well as the Christian Reformed denomination, right? Despite all all the pains and all the struggles and all the difficulties that churches go through, we are thankful for them. In the midst of ministries and different institutions that have shaped us and formed us, we see God at work in the history of these things, that in his church, he has impacted us. And so, too, we can be thankful looking forward. We're thankful that the gospel continues to spread right here in neighborhoods and communities like our own, as well as in places around the world that are hearing it for the very first time. We trust that God is not yet done growing his kingdom, and so we are thankful to him for that. And we are thankful that one day, we don't know when, Christ will return. Christ will come back. He will gather all of his children to himself. And there will be an eternity of rejoicing and giving thanks with one another to the God who is and who was and is to come. Because he is unchanging and and he will forever be. And so, brothers and sisters, do not take for granted what we have today. But also do not forget what God has done in the past and what God is yet to do in the future. Be satisfied with all that he offers. And pray, expressing your love to and for him. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we give you thanks again for your word. We give you thanks for the example that that King David set before us. Lord, of his own situation, that that he was humble, that, that he was trusting you, that he was seeing your goodness. Lord God, that he would honor and depend on you, that he would not think more highly of himself than he ought even though most people would say that that he could think much more highly of himself. Lord God, we pray that you would instill that same humility in each one of us, but also that we would be reminded that you are the king on the throne, 
that you are the one who knows all of history and who has had a plan since before the foundations of this world were set. And you will come through. You will do what needs to be done, that your purposes will be served. And you will receive all praise and glory. Lord, may we have that perspective that that you are over all things, that you are over our lives, and that we are dependent on you. For Jesus' sake. At this time, our praise team is going to come forward and they will lead us in. Now, thank we all our God. Let's stand to sing. Maybe see them. Let's lift up our prayers to God now. O sovereign Lord, you are God, the Lord Almighty God over all the earth, and God over all your church. Lord, as we come to your presence this morning, we give you thanks again for just so many abundant blessings that you have granted to us. Lord God, for for food and and for homes, for vehicles and and, and for work. That Lord God, you have sustained us in our daily lives. Lord God, you've also sustained us through your church. Lord God, through the preaching of the word, through the opportunity to to worship and gather in the freedoms that we have. Lord, we give you thanks for that. We give you thanks for, for, for the, the Bible studies and, and for the fellowship groups of this church, for Sunday school, and Lord God, for the ways that you continue to form us and shape us as your disciples. We thank you for the teachers and for the leaders who have stepped forth and, and who have volunteered their time to serve and, and, and to guide us. Lord, we are thankful for the, the many prayers that, that we have seen answered. And Lord God, it is. It's easy to often take those things for granted that, that we've set them before you and, and we see progress and, and we just say, well, that's, that's how things should be. But Lord God, we are thankful and we are humbled by the way that you have answered 
our prayers favorably. Lord God, that you have been with Lainey Monikin in, in this past week as she had surgery. Lord God, that you brought her through that and, and things seem to have gone well. We pray that you'd be with her in the, the months ahead. Lord God, we give you thanks for healing that, that you've brought to Karen Ashton in this last few days. Lord God, and we pray that you would continue to sustain her and be with her as she continues to, to rest. Lord God, we give you thanks for the, the healing that you've given to Rick and for the, the ongoing strength that you've granted to him in, in the battle that he's been going through. Lord, continue to be with him. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for, for the way that you have blessed us and, and, and for for Mark in his recovery. Lord God, continue to watch over him, bring strength back to him, but we're thankful, Lord God, that he's been able to go back to work and, and, and go about life rather normally. Lord, we're thankful for the offerings that have been collected in, in the Peter fish and, and those that are, are yet to be returned. Lord God, we pray that as the offering is received and, and they are sent off to, to world renew, Lord God, that they would be used in places where they are needed most, places that you already know and and, Lord God, that they would not only provide a, an immediate emergency need for people, but, Lord God, that, that it might continue to grow them and, and shape and form their lives. Lord God, we give you thanks for the ways that you have continued to, to watch over so many of us and, and different things that we've had going on, different medical ailments, different struggles that we've been facing. And, Lord God, we pray that you continue to be with us. Lord, we bring our petitions before you as as David did that as well. And, and Lord God, we, we pray for safety on the roads today for the many who are, are traveling. And, and Lord God, for, for a blessed gathering of family and friends. Lord God, including those who are, are separated by great distance, that they might be able to, to continue to express love and gratitude for each other. Lord God, we bring before you those who, who continue to struggle with, with chronic pains and chronic illnesses. Lord God, we pray that you be with Carol in, in the midst of of the demonia that has continued and, and the struggle that she's been having. Lord, be with her and, and bring healing to her body and, and strength and clarity uh, for next steps if, if things need to change. Lord God, we think of others, too, who uh, on this day of, of thanksgiving uh, are mourning. Uh, Lord God, we lament the violence that, that we've seen in different places around our country in recent days and, and to recognize that there are families who are, are heartbroken and grieving of the loss of loved ones and, and the injuries that, that others have sustained in days gone by. Lord God, be with them. We pray that your grace would be shown, that your love would be known throughout our land, throughout the world. Lord God, that people might come to a saving knowledge of you and, and might know the comfort that you provide. Lord God, we pray too that you would be with those who, on this day as we think about the blessing of harvest so far, those who have, have yet to bring in the harvest completed. Lord God, for farmers, we ask that you would keep them safe in, in the work that they have to do in, in the coming weeks. Lord, allow them to, to do what needs to be done. Lord, we pray that you would continue to be with us in this day. We thank you most of all for the gift of your son, Jesus. Lord God, for our Savior, for the one who, who saw us while we were yet sinners and enemies and in who decided that, that you wanted us and gave us your love. Lord, we pray that, that as we uh, give you thanks for him, that, that you would also continue to forgive us our sins, Lord God, as we recognize the ways that we fall short and that we struggle to do your will. Lord, help us to bring these things before you and, and, and allow us to, to see your spirit and to follow your spirit, that we might bear fruit for the kingdom of God. Lord, be with us as we go our homeward way on, on this morning. Bless the time that we have had together. Bless the time that we look forward to coming back on Sunday, if you would will us. Oh, Lord, all thanks and praise to you, the sovereign God of all, the Lord Almighty. Amen. People of God, would you stand to receive God's parting benediction? Brothers and sisters, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. We close this morning with how can I keep from sinning.